It's good to see you. It's good to be with you today. Before I read scripture, let me reintroduce Advent to you and introduce our Advent series. Uh, David has already made very clear that Advent is that season on the church calendar to help us anticipate the second coming of Jesus Christ by remembering his first coming. So Advent means coming or arrival. And so it's a season where we wait. But we wait with expectation for something wonderful to happen. Better put, for someone wonderful to come. And isn't that what Jesus has already done in his first Advent? Wonderfully coming as a humble baby. And that second Advent, he will wonderfully come as a glorious king. Advent reminds us of that. And that's because of our church calendar, not the one that hangs on the wall in the office, but the global church calendar, sometimes called the liturgical year. It is not binding on Christians like Scripture is, but it has encouraged millions of Christians down through the centuries because it reflects the gracious and faithful rhythms of the God of the Bible, which is far, far better than the unsettling rhythms of this broken and cursed world. As you and I know, each year, January to December, will bring with it a kind of dissonance that unsettles us as wars start and end, movements rise and fall, good and bad flow. Compare that, though, to the never-ending, never-giving-up love of the Lord reflected in the church calendar. It steadies us. Let me give you a simple example. January is just around the corner, and that's the beginning of our calendar year as a nation. And usually, we begin that year with our many resolutions to overcome our failings, don't we? Overcome our failings of diet, overcome our failings of exercise, even overcome our failings of reading the Bible and praying. Compare that to God's resolution to overcome our failings by sending His Son. That is what Advent is about. Advent is not a time of doing and failing. Advent instead is a time of receiving and rejoicing in God's gift of His Son. So this year we will use the four Sundays of Advent season to preach about Jesus from the New Testament books written by the Apostle John. Week one is mine, and I'll preach from John's Gospel, chapter one. Week two, Ken will continue in John's Gospel, chapter one. Week three, Jonathan will move us into John's first letter, 1 John, chapter one. And then week four, David will wrap things up in our Advent series by preaching to us from Revelation, chapter one. All of those books were written by the Apostle John, and all of them were written to answer Many questions, but the question that we want to meditate on this year for Advent is who is this Jesus? Who is this Jesus? And we hope that you will join us as we meditate on this for the next four Sundays. So having said all of that, our scripture reading today is John chapter 1, verses 1 through 13. Listen as I read. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. The true light which gives light to everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own and his own people did not receive him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And this is God's word. John writes these first 13 verses to give us lasting joy and to teach us about our meaning and purpose in life as well as who we are as Christians. 
our lasting joy, our meaning and purpose in life, who we are can only be found in Jesus. So when John answers the question today, who is this Jesus? He answers it three ways from these 13 verses. First, he says Jesus is not like any other God. He alone can give us lasting joy. Two, Jesus is not like any other man. Once you discover who he is, you discover your meaning and purpose in life. And three, Jesus is not like any other name. Once we find out who he is, we understand who we are as his children. And that is what gives us joy and purpose and meaning and identity in life. So let's follow that outline through these 13 verses. Number one, Jesus is not like any other God. That is what John is trying to convey in verse one. Look at verse one again. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. With that verse, John is trying to distinguish Jesus from all other gods to establish that Jesus is unique. So how does he do it? Let me give you some background, okay? Jesus was born into a world that was filled with other gods, right? I mean, there was Caesar, who was also known as the Roman Emperor, and he was believed by his people to be divine, and so he was worshipped. And then there was Zeus, who was the supreme god of the Greek pantheon, and he was worshipped for the supposed protection that he brought to humanity. So you had the Roman god, you had the Greek god, and then there were hundreds of these local and household deities which were venerated for the meaning that they were thought to bring to people. Jesus was born into a world that was teeming with other gods. And he was also born into a world that was filled with other ideas. By this time, the philosophers like Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, they were long dead and off the scene, but their ideas they lingered in the air, and people were breathing them in. Ideas like Socrates' idea, who believed the gods aren't really as important as everyone makes them out to be. Or Plato's idea that good really does exist, but it exists in the immaterial part of man, his spirit. The body is bad. Nothing good can be in a body. And then there was Aristotle, who went as far as to create God in his own image by speaking of God and worshiping God mostly as a philosopher. So the world um, of Jesus was swarming with these other gods and ideas. So having said all that, how will then the writer John distinguish Jesus from all these other gods? He will do it in a way in the first verse that you may not expect. And he does so by talking about Jesus as he exists in Trinity. In verse 1, John is cracking open the door to the mystery of the Trinity. Look at verse 1 again. In the beginning was the Word. We know that's Jesus from verse 14. And the Word was with God, that's a reference to the Father. And the Word was God. That's a reference to Jesus' deity. So here's a rough translation of verse 1. In the beginning was Jesus, and Jesus was with the Father, and Jesus was God just like the Father. That's what John means in verse 1. And John 1.1 1, 1 is one of the many verses that we use to develop our doctrine of the Trinity. And Trinity, simply put, is God is one but he exists in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And this is what distinguishes him from all other gods. It shows the uniqueness of Jesus. It shows the uniqueness of the Christian faith. No other God exists in Trinity. Jesus is not like any other God. Jesus is not like any other God from the Old Testament. Baal, Dagon, Moloch. He's not like any of those gods. He's not like any god from the New Testament. Caesar, Zeus, all of those household deities. Jesus is not like any of those gods. He's not like any modern-day god 
the God of Islam or Mormonism or Jehovah's Witness. He is utterly different. Think of it this way. You cannot hide God in a saddlebag like Rachel in Genesis hid those household idols from her father Laban and then sat on them. Or you cannot make a statue that captures his essence like the Athenians thought they were doing with the gods in the book of Acts. You cannot worship him like other religions worship their gods because he is not like any other god. And John cracks open the door in verse 1 to a mystery which we will never fully comprehend, which you can be relieved that I'm not about to try and explain today, but will excite our attention forever because this mystery's attention is on us. And John does that with a technical word in verse 1. It's one little word. It's the word with in that second phrase. And the word was with God. And you might say, look, that doesn't sound very technical to me. I mean, after all, I was with people this past Thanksgiving and there was nothing technical about us being with each other. We enjoyed a meal together. We enjoyed each other's company. That's why John uses the word. He uses the word with to talk about the enjoyment that Jesus had with the Father from eternity past. Jesus was enjoying personal time with the Father. And it's a technical word because every time it's used, or most every time it's used in the New Testament, it means the same thing. It means a person is with a person. So John is saying that Jesus and the Father are enjoying a personal relationship with each other in eternity past. Jesus is not like any other God. And it's this one truth that John introduces to us which brings about great change in our lives during this Advent season. It does really bring us lasting joy, and it does so in two ways. It, it makes us more humble, and it makes us happier. It makes us humble. C.S. Lewis, who was not a theologian, but was able to plain talk theological concepts for the church in a beautiful way which retained their truth but made them wonderful lewis said in christianity god is not an impersonal thing not even just one person but a dynamic pulsating activity a life a kind of drama almost if you will not think me irreverent a kind of dance the pattern of this three personal life is the great fountain of energy and beauty spurting up at the very center of reality. Why does a quote like that, a description of God like that, why does that make us humble? Does that sound like God is lonely? Does that sound like He is in need or He's wanting of anything? A dynamic, pulsating activity, a life this three-personal life, a great fountain of energy spurting up of beauty and joy? No, no. God is complete in Himself. Nothing outside of God compelled Him to show Himself to us. Nothing. Yet out of His own freedom, He turned and created us. Verse 3. Shared life with us. Verse 4. Continued to exercise tough patience with us. Verse 5. That is humbling. But it also brings us happiness. Because the world that we were born into is filled with gods and religions and ideas who promise joy and meaning and purpose and identity. But Jesus, the Word, the Word cuts through all the ignorance and deception to make Himself known. He captures our attention. Advent season. He is not like any other God. He's not like any other man. And that's what John means by introducing John the Baptist 
in these next verses. John, the gospel writer, introduces the forerunner of the Savior. Verses 6, 7, and 8. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to bear witness about the light that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. Think with me for a few minutes about John the Baptist and about Jesus and about how much they had in common as men. Okay? Number one, they had a common family. Their mothers, Elizabeth and Mary, were relatives. Number two, they both had unusual conceptions, right? Elizabeth was too old to have a baby, and Mary hadn't been with a man. Number three, from their early days, God was with them in uncanny ways. Luke tells us that John the Baptist was filled with the Holy Spirit, even while in his mother's womb. And then about Jesus, Luke tells us that Jesus grew and became strong, filled with wisdom, and the favor of God was upon him. And then Luke follows that description of Jesus in his gospel with Jesus in the temple at 12 years old, astounding the teachers of the law with his questions and answers. Number four, their messages were identical. John came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus came preaching, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Five, they both were sent from God to proclaim that a light had dawned in the world. They have so much in common. So much so that people then over time could easily have picked up on these similarities and begun to think, wow, two unusual men, two special men, two extraordinary men, two brave men, two men who were willing to speak against the authorities of their day, two men who were killed by the authorities of their day. So much in common. And so John, the gospel writer, makes absolutely clear in verse 8 about John the Baptist that he was not the light, but came to bear witness about the light. So as we introduce the sermon in the series, I briefly mention this unsettling dissonance that the world brings to us with its gods and its ideas, what we have to deal with this time of year and why, we're thank why, why we are thankful for Jesus. Sadly, though, the same kind of dissonance can be found in the church when people start to compete with Jesus, forgetting that they are, forgetting who they are and who he is. Jesus is the light, not us. The Apostle Paul will change the, the metaphor in 1 Corinthians chapter 3. He'll go from talking about a light to talking about a building foundation. And Paul will say that there is only one foundation on which the church can build, and that foundation has already been laid, and that foundation is Jesus Christ. And so in talking about a building foundation, Paul is using that metaphor to say, look, poor foundations will eventually lead to flimsy and disjointed buildings. Good foundations will eventually lead to stable and, and unified buildings. But you have to build on the right foundation. He wrote that to the Corinthian church because the Corinthians were trying to remove that foundation of Jesus Christ and build on their own style, their own giftedness, their own wits, their own witness. That's what they were trying to build on. And Paul says it won't work because when the light is revealed from heaven, when Christ returns, any building structure, any ministry, any gospel attempt at proclaiming Jesus Christ that is not built on him but in, instead is built on us, it'll just burn up when the light is exposed. So Paul uses this different metaphor John uses the metaphor of light. We are not the foundation, Christ is. We are not the light, Christ is. And I think this is why Martin Luther, 
in his sermon on the Gospel of John, said, if Christians regarded Christ as the only light and staunchly adhered to that belief, then our views, doctrine, and faith would be uniform and our sermons would convey the same harmonious message everywhere in the world. Luther had a tendency to exaggerate at times, so common views, common doctrines among all the churches around the world is not likely until Christ comes back. But what Luther said next in the quote is spot on. He said, pious Christian teachers direct the people away from themselves and to Christ, as St. John does here with his testimony. For all our sermons tend toward this one goal, that you and we know and believe that Christ is the only Savior and consolation of the world. The gospel points to Christ exclusively. What is Luther doing? He's doing the same thing John the Gospel writer is doing. They are emphasizing that the light doesn't need help to shine. Like the sun doesn't need any of us to say, hey, look up in the sky in order for it to shine brightly. And so anyone this Christmas season, especially this Christmas season, who is trying to bear witness to the light should be careful lest they overvalue their ministry. You are not the light. Christ is the light. And on the other hand, don't undervalue your ministry as a witness. John's witness was not unimportant. Neither is I. Neither is ours. You may remember this verse from Matthew chapter 11, verse 11, when Jesus said, Truly I say to you, among those born of women, there has arisen no one greater than John the Baptist. Meaning, because John had the privilege of standing closer to the light than any prophet before him, he was considered great, the greatest among women. And yet then Jesus goes on to say, the one who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Meaning, because of our standing in the church next to the resurrected Lord, the light shines even brighter. And that is who we point to now. And so Advent season is an especially good time to witness for Christ. Don't overvalue your ministry. Don't undervalue your ministry. And when you do witness for Christ, make sure you get it right. And I don't say that to put a lot of pressure on you. Okay, that you say the right words. Um, 25, not 24, not 26, to make sure you get it all perfect. Remember, it's the Spirit of God who beautifies our words in the hearings of people. But remember, when you witness for Christ, you do have to use words. I know that there's this popular saying that goes around from time to time that says, preach the gospel, use words if necessary. That's misleading. It's misleading because it confuses the gospel with what follows from the gospel. What follows from the gospel is good works. But salvation is not based on good works. If it was, then the best way to communicate the gospel would be by your good works. But Paul says in Romans that faith comes by what? Hearing, not doing. Therefore, we eventually have to tell others about who Christ is and what he has done. And let me tell you why this is so important. Because if we don't, we just continue to set a good example for people and never get around to telling them about the light, about what he did and who he is, we actually may be outshining the light. And we don't want to do that. We want to be people to, we want people to hear about this man, this God-man, Jesus. And number three, Jesus is not like any other name. The name Jesus means Yahweh is salvation. Yahweh is the name that God revealed to Moses in Exodus chapter 3. The name Jesus then reminds us of the God of the Old Testament who presents himself as one 
who has always been full of mercy and grace and pardon for those who would follow him. John is trying to lead up to this glorious truth in verse 9 with everything that he has said in the first eight verses. Who is this Jesus? That's the question John is answering. And he has told us so much in these first eight verses. Can I just briefly review with you before we move on here? Who is this Jesus? He is the Son who existed before the creation. He eternally delighted in the lively perfections of the Father and the Holy Spirit. As the Trinitarian theologians like to say, each of the members of the Trinity harboring the others at the center of his being, God existing unaided, effusive, cheerful, full of energy, self-existent, self-fulfilling. Then, Jesus with the Father and the Spirit turn their attention for no reason other than inner Trinitarian love outward and create all that is. And though His creatures rebel, He out of love recreates new people by calling Abraham, orchestrating His life and everyone connected to Him to tell men and women of their need for a Savior and that He's on the way and finally, in the fullness of time, God sent forth His Son with the love of the Trinity to share with us. But He is rejected because the sinful world is competing for the love of people. Isn't it ironic? The way Jesus tried to show His love was create, creating a world of love and now it distracts us from Him. All of that as prologue to what John says in verses 9 and following. The true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own people did not receive him. It would be a grim ending if it wasn't for the name of Jesus. God saves. I want to slow down for a moment and help you understand what John is saying. God will not be denied who he is. That's what John is saying. If he says, I am a merciful and gracious God to people, then people will experience his mercy and grace. He says, I am a savior to people, then people will experience his salvation. And we do. Because God will not be denied who he is. He is a savior. And another way that God describes his purpose to save in these verses is to use the metaphor of children of God. See that? The end of verse 12, children of God. This is just a different way of saying the same thing. If God wants a family, he will not be denied. But he will do it his way and not our way. And that's why John introduces us to these three negative statements. John says, not of blood, which means your family or your race doesn't make you a child of God. I mean, think about it. Jesus and the Jews were of the same blood and that didn't save the Jews. It's not of the will of the flesh. That's an idiom for sexual passion between a husband and a wife. But a child of God isn't born like a baby is to a mother and a father. It's not a physical process. It's a spiritual process. Not by the will of man in a patriarchal society the man usually initiated intimacy with his wife. I'm just telling you what the commentators said. But if he withholds himself from her, obviously there will be no baby. And John is masterfully saying, 
that a man may be able to deny his wife children, but no one can deny God his spiritual children. And why? Because John ends with, all of this is of God. So do you see what's happened in these 13 verses? We've come full circle. We started with God in verse 1. We're ending with God in verse 13, which is John's way of saying our lives are caught up in the life and the will of God. That's what Advent's about. In Christ and in Christ alone do we find forgiveness for sins and our highest identity in life as his children, all because Jesus is not like any other name. So at the beginning of this Advent season, may God bless us through these verses to make plans for the coming year, not around our personal goals and interests, but around the goals and interests of Jesus, who is the Word, who speaks to us for God and says, I'm coming back. Jesus, who is the light, making himself known in a dark world. We simply just point the way. And Jesus, who is our salvation. Who is this Jesus? He is our lasting joy, our meaning and purpose in life, giving us our identity. We are his children, caught up in the love of Father, Son, and Spirit, a love we are still just beginning to understand. May God use this Advent season to bless us with this and other great wonders. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are making all things new through Jesus by your Spirit. And although we have sinned and are still prone to all kinds of evil, by sheer grace, without any deserving of our own whatsoever, we can be your children. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Amen.